it's on. I think it's just people are very excited. It's, you know. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be in here where it's dry, yes. momentarily anyway. Um, I'm Kate Marker, and I'm executive director here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens, and I'm very happy to welcome you um, here tonight. I'd like to give a special welcome to those of you joining us in simulcast. But before we continue, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. Make sure you've turned off everything that beeps or chirps or sings or, you know, whatever. Tonight, we remember Marjorie Post's youngest daughter, known as Dina Merrill, who passed away exactly one year ago today. Dina was, of course, a very glamorous actress. She was a model, a philanthropist who supported women's health issues, diabetes research, and the arts. She was a passionate supporter of Hillwood. And I'm delighted to announce tonight that thanks to the generosity of her family, Hillwood will soon begin the process of converting the Camellia House, which is that beautiful little building near the cafe, to become the Dina Merrill Pavilion. Wow. Yes. Yay. Absolutely. So uh, it will take a little bit of doing because we have quite a bit of construction to do to move what's in the pavilion out underneath the parking deck, but that's another story. But it's happening. <laughs> it will be happening. So I know that most of you are already Hillwood members, and so I want to make sure that you have the member preview days for Fabergé Rediscovered on your calendars. So I want to be sure you're going to join us for a sneak peek of this fascinating new exhibition. Uh, the member days are Wednesday, June 6th, Thursday, June 7th, and Friday, June 8th. And Wilfred will be talking all day long at this, yes. So, uh, so if you uh, haven't already joined, it's a perfect time to join, or you could think about upgrading your membership to the contributor level uh, or above to join us for uh, Wilfred's Curator's Reception, which is on Thursday night, June the 7th. So it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Megan Martinelli Campbell is one of two fabulous new curators here at Hillwood. In January, Megan started as the assistant curator of apparel, jewelry, and accessories. She came to us from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute, where she was a research assistant and contributed to internal object assessment research and assisted with exhibitions including China Through the Looking Glass in 2015 and Manus Ex Machina, Fashion in the Age of Technology in 2016. So I know many of you probably saw both of those absolutely sensational exhibitions. So um, we expect a lot of you, Megan. <laughs> Before joining the Met, Megan curated an exhibition entitled The Other White Dress, Non-Wedding Dresses of the 21st Century at the University of Rhode Island's Historic uh, Textile Gallery and contributed to Artist Rebel Dandy, Men of Fashion, at the RISD Museum of Art. She holds an MS in Textiles and Costumes from the University of Rhode Island and a BA in English Literature from Providence uh, College. Here at Hillwood, she's currently organizing an exhibition about the work of 20th century photographer Albert Eisenstadt, which will open in June of 2019. So please join me in welcoming Megan Martinelli Campbell. Thank you so much, Kate. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming out in the rain to hear me discuss the fashionable life of Dina Merrill. Um, some notes about this project. Um, this presentation is was manifested by my preparation for the spring mansion rotation um, in conjunction with the special exhibition of Fabergé. 
um, Wilfred was planning out what he would be installing in the jewelry case, and it was going to be many of Marjorie's precious Fabergé frames that feature portraits of Dina. And it kind of started to really make sense that Dina passed um, away this last May around this time, and we just thought that it would be a lovely way to remember her by um, bringing her wardrobe and the pieces that we have in our collection out in focus for this spring. Um, additionally, um, I discovered that there's so much on Dina in fashion and that her lifetime really embraces 20th, 20th century fashion, beginning with her time on her mother's yacht as in the 1930s as a young adult, moving forward to her glamorous 1940s wedding and her career as a model and as an actress in the 50s and 60s, even further to her social um, work, charities and philanthropies, and of course her contribution here at Hillwood. So I would really like to um, invite you to kind of chronologically travel with me through Dina's life as we look at American 20th century fashion through her gaze. So let's begin in 1920s New York City um, when Dina was born. So Dina, baby Dina, born Nadina, um, Nadina Hutton in 1923 at 2 East 2nd Street in New York City. Here you have a view of her birthplace, which was the mansion that Marjorie and E.F. Hutton owned. And you also have um, a wonderful view of her as an infant in her kind of very luxurious pointed hooded little capelet. You can see it's quilted, it's silk, it looks it looks so comfortable even to put on a, on a day like today. And it definitely was um, popular in French fashion plates, uh, kind of commemorating that time period, documenting that time period. In the middle, you have a little baby in a very similar silhouette. And there above is her fantastic nursery from that time period. Dina's mother was a fashion icon. She was a global shopper who was invested in um, patronizing the best dressmakers and department stores. She shopped for her children um, at some of the finest stores in New York City and abroad. This included La Grande Maison de Blanc of Paris, where she purchased Dina's ermine-trimmed <laughs> bonnet at the right. La Grande, La Grande Maison de Blanc of Paris um, was on the Boulevard de Capucine, and there you could purchase um, specialty woven linens, tablecloths, um, along with layettes, trousseaus, any manner of fine, custom, luxuriously embroidered handwork was available there. So, as you might imagine, um, the department store became very popular with the royal and aristocratic societies of Europe. Um, just as an example, the Royal Collection Trust at Windsor Castle holds doll clothes that belonged to Princess Elizabeth and Margaret from that very firm. So Dina's mother was shopping for her in very good company. All right, so here we have just a general sense of Dina as an infant and young child in the 1930s. Um, always wearing very simple, loose clothes with fine details like ruffle and embroidery, and also little bloomers peeking out of short dresses was um, very popular. And you know, um, this was one of the first generations following the Victorian age, so it's kind of nice to see children easing up and having a chance to play, maybe wearing bifurcated garments instead of shorts, or instead of skirts, and really getting um, to enjoy their childhood. So 
So Dina had some early fun growing up in New York. Um, she had a prized teddy bear who she loved to dress up in costumes with. Uh, she, it had its own little wardrobe, so to speak. So here's a picture of her um, engaging in fashion with possibly with that teddy bear. And here are some lace, here's another lace trimmed collar dress from a, simil from a, um, a fashion plate from that time period. So growing up, Dina had two older sisters um, from her mother's first marriage to um, Ed Close, and they were Adelaide and Eleanor. She later remembers being very influenced by Eleanor's glamorous Parisian style. She also had a niece who was four years younger than her named Marjorie Post Durant, and she fondly called her Marwi, and sometimes they matched. And she found a, um, you know, a frequent playmate in young Marwi. And again, you see the smocking and the very whimsical prints, puff sleeves. So for her sister Adelaide's 1927 wedding, Marjorie had a special flower girl dress created for her daughter. This dress is trimmed with mink and has delicate little tassels and even includes a matching cloche and simple cream slippers. The dress is on display in the mansion right now, if you would like to see it, and was created by Mrs. Martina Downing of 22 East 65th Street in New York City. Here's a little advertisement announcing a special pop-up shop of sorts for Vassar students from around the same time period. And what's more, another dress with the same dressmaker's label exists in a private collection. This one was made for um, a woman and features some really lovely embellishment and details including handmade ribbon flowers, beading, silk lined bow, you can just see the pink popping out, that was intentional, and an incredible hidden closure system that's very elaborate. This was before zippers really came into um, prominence, so if you wanted to hide your closure, um, you had to deal with a series of hooks, hook and eyes, but it, it, it certainly <coughs> looked incredible. So please do check out Baby Dina's flower girl dress made by this fantastic undersung dressmaker. <laughs> so like adults of the time period in the 30s and late 20s, Dina dressed up in fancy dress costumes for children's balls and events in Palm Beach and on Long Island in the Hamptons. At the far right, she's a little Perot. In the center, in Palm Beach, she's dressed as a sponge or seashell girl. She actually remembers having her nanny um, stick these little sponges to her. And then she here she's dressed as a Swiss peasant girl, and she um, was featured in a couple of society articles for this particular costume because it was so successful. Then over here, she's a, a little bohemian kind of artistic girl. So I think that perhaps this flair for the dramatics and dressing up might have influenced her in later years. For some dog shows, Dina is classically dressed over here as a perfect little 1920s flapper, and then later even more sportily with her schnauzer in the 1930s in a polo. This photo over here at the right, it looks very modern to me. She could be any girl today, which I appreciate. I have really found that the scrapbooks here at Hillwood are an incredible source for um, getting a sense of what everyone really wore, particularly Dina, for this project. And I harvested them for this um, presentation, I might add. So here are some images of Dina on the sea cloud. She's wearing beach pajamas. It's the 1930, early 1930s. Um, 
she's lucky that she's growing up um, during the rise of sportswear and that she so appreciates being out on the water and traveling and beach pajamas became popular in the 1920s and they were a little less daring um, in the 1930s but still the idea of wearing pants certainly is a novelty um, I love this center photo because she's really using the trousers to full of effect doing her cartwheel So again, in the 1930s, um, swimsuits were evolving to have an elasticized yarn called Lastex. So here, she's probably enjoying such technology. Um, here's a comparable example from Hermes, where um, you see the built it, uh, belted silhouette. And then here she is in a romper on a giant turtle in the Galapagos. And here's a similar romp romper with a ruched, ruched um, leg openings, kind of like what she has on here. As we move a little forward into a more for some more formal occasions during that time period. Um, Letty Linton was a very popular film in 1932 starring Betty Davis and its um, costumes were designed by Gilbert Adrian who was one of the revered designers of that time period and the silhouette of the Letty Linton gown is characterized of having a very narrow skirt and then very full emphasized shoulders. Um, Letty Linton had actual tiered ruffles on her gown. You see this kind of trickling in through these fashion plates and these images of Dina from the early to mid 1930s where she has a capelet style collar and here she's even wearing a little capelet to emphasize her shoulder. This picture on the right is of Dina at one of Eleanor's weddings in the 1930s. <laughs> For her winter 1935 wedding to Joseph Davis, uh, this was not her wedding, this was her mother's wedding, I should correct. <laughs> she was very young at this time. She was not getting married. She wore an ice blue Ampere waisted gown from a costume designer in New York City named Veronica. Um, her company was called Veronica Stage Costumes and she was a designer who worked with lots of Broadway, um, Broadway shows. Um, the thing that I like the most about this gown and the veil, which are on display in the post bedroom suite in the large closet currently, is that they kind of refer back to the previous designs of the 19th century, the early 19th century, kind of this very romantic um, Doric column kind of silhouette and then having this um, dramatic puff sleeve on the side. Historicism in dress was very popular for young children during that time period of the 1930s. Further along, as she came of age in the 1940s, there was very careful attention that Dina would not become a glamour girl. But if these three portraits are any evidence. I think she may have become a glamour girl. <laughs> um, she did aspire to become an actress and the things, the qualities that I love the most about these portraits are number one, some of the feminine details of this time period like eyelet lace and these incredible bows and um, ruffles. Also she's wearing pearls and all of them which kind of becomes her trademark and she's one of the few people who could really pull off a 1940s victory roll hairstyle. She just has that credible, incredible bone structure to pull it off. So early 1940s, 1941 to be exact, as exact, the New York Times reported that that September, a supper dance was held at the original Hillwood in Roslyn, Long Island. It notes that several hundred attended and that 
Nadina would make her formal debut on December 20th of that year. For her debut, she expected a more low-key affair, a tea, but she still very likely commemorated the event in this incredible gown of ostrich and gold sequins, um, topped by a short fur jacket. Um, so these two photos are for, from that September, that very night of the event, of the supper, and then the center photo is a portrait by Albert Murray that was subsequently painted. Um, my favorite thing is that he kind of, you know, said, I'm not that crazy about this halter strap. Let's make it completely <laughs> strapless. So he did. Um, but yes, um, I'm not sure who the designer is. I'm still working on it. I have a hunch that it could be Sophie Gimbel of Saks Fifth Avenue, who I will discuss in a moment. So two years later, um, Dina moved to New York and attended the Academy of American Academy of Dramatic Arts. She supported herself by becoming a model for American Vogue. Here is her first cover on the far right, shot by John Rawlings. In it, she's wearing a hat and suit by Hattie Carnegie. Hattie Carnegie was an uh, Austrian-born American designer who began her career as a milliner, later becoming a ladies' garment designer. She sold and imported um, clothes from France and also designed her own line and had a very successful jewelry line as well. Um, what's notable about Hattie Carnegie is that she wasn't a technical designer herself. She was just very good at um, imparting her ideas and taste to um, illustrators and um, pattern cutters and other designers, kind of like today's modern Rei Kawakubo. She had a staff that she directed um, and was excellent at sharing her vision. Um, in a full circle moment, here is an advertisement for Hattie Carnegie's perfume line. Um, from a few years after Hattie's actual death, they were producing a perfume called Hattie Carnegie Pink. And who do you think sketched that cute little bird? <laughs> Dina! That's an advertisement from 1963 uh, Vogue, and I thought that was a sweet full circle moment. For these 1940s Vogue shoots, Dina worked with American photographer John Rawlings. John Rawlings joined the staff at British Vogue in 1938, but later moved to American Vogue in 1940. Edna Woolman Chase, who was then the editor of Vogue during that time period, specifically brought Rawlings on because he was kind of the antidote to the um, kind of over-designed, dramatic photography that had become popular with the rise of Beaton and Horse P. Horst. John Rawlings infused his shoots with kind of natural light, easy glamour, lots of color, and I think that that's something that's really evident in these glowing portraits of Dina from that time period. They, the one on the left especially looks so modern. Um, I really appreciate that quality about him, and I didn't know so much about him until I started this project, so. More shots by Rawling and a possible match. Dina may be wearing a play suit by Claire McCardle, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, the reason I think that it could be Claire McCardle is it's around the same time period that her designs were popular. And there's an elasticized leg opening on these shorts and also on the um, play suit example here. And Claire loved using plaids in her designs. Um, Claire designed under the label Townley Frocks. Um, she was briefly at Hattie Carnegie, but she was a little 
too modern, a little, a tiny bit too, you know, wasn't as buttoned up as Hattie Carnegie during that time period. So she was back at Townley Frocks and she's known for really modern, casual and functional, functional designs. Um, she still followed the silhouette of the 40s and 50s, you know, the nipped in waist and the full skirt, um, but she added a layer of ease and comfort to it. You wouldn't wear a girdle with a Claire McCart ensemble. You would just have a really lovely wide belt or um, a deliberately cut skirt instead of tons of layers of petticoats to get the full skirted effect. They wear. So um, again, my final shot from the series by John Rawlings, where I just kind of wanted to highlight Dina in the 40s in fashion in vogue. Um, she's wearing a kind of folksy peasant dress, um, puff sleeves, horizontal um, embellishment. And here's a dress by Hattie Carnegie, I might add. Also very playful. Um, I think that in the 1940s, designers were kind of responding a little bit with whimsy and a little bit of color and um, really lovely design details. Um, so I chose this dress because the silhouette's similar and the design is similar. And um, one thing you might not know about that particular example is that the tiny blue um, motifs are little frogs and then there's little rows of sequins above them. So here's one more John Rawlings and here she is. It's a very dramatic um, Renaissance style gown, very similar to one worn by her mother a few years earlier. Um, Dina's gown in this portrait was designed um, for Henry Bendel and Marjorie's gown was designed by Ori Kelly, who is a costume designer um, in the 30s and 40s. And he was the gentleman who worked um, on the costume designs for Mission to Moscow, which was um, the movie that came out of uh, Marjorie's husband, Joseph Davies' memoirs of living in Russia. So Marjorie had this gown created for herself for this portrait that would be in the film. Here's the actual dress, which we have here in our collection at Hillwood. Um, they're both luxurious velvet gowns, and they both have some really historically um, inspired embellishment on the sleeves and kind of close to the neckline. I also like that Marjorie wore her gown um, low on her shoulder line, as Dina does in this photo. This appreciation for Renaissance fashion can kind of be traced back to a special fashion show that was held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, the, in 1942. For that fashion show, designers were invited to take inspiration from the medieval and Renaissance collections at the Met for their designs. And I did find that Bertha Stearns, who was at um, Henry Bendel during that time period she indeed did design some gowns so it's likely that this could have been a, a hangover from you know that kind of spirit a few years before So in this uncredited and undated photo I did kind of get the sense that it could perhaps be a Charles James ribbon gown. And you see these two examples here. Um, Charles James was a revisionist. So many times he would come up with the same designs over and over again over the course of years. Change the silhouette, change a ornamentation or construction detail for a different client. And it's very possible that this could have been an earlier rendition of one of his ribbon gowns. Um, Charles James was a very temperamental designer, but he was a genius. He was favored by the 1940s and 50s social set for evening 
where um, he's recognized for his innovative sculptural manipulation of the silhouette. And of course, you might know that Marjorie wore a Charles James because of course she did in the 1957 um, issue of Vogue. So Dina traveled with the USO in a production of Moss Hart's traveling um, troupe, Moss Hart being the uh, Broadway producer, um, the man who came to dinner during the war. So here she is in her USO regalia. You can see very, you know, very moody 1940s photo shoot. This would have been in 1945. And then that very same year, when she returned to New York, she made her Broadway debut in a production of Mermaids Singing. The very following year, in 1946, she got married in Long Island. And for her wedding, she wore a gown custom made by Sophie Gimbel for Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, that gown that she wore is on display in the mansion currently, along with the veil, indeed. And here in the center, they had so much fun probably getting ready for the wedding together, is Marjorie's dress also designed by Gimbel for Saks Fifth Avenue. And you can see the gown, you can see the veil on display in the bedroom in the mansion currently. You can also see Marjorie's very fluffy hat on display up there presently. So Sophie Gimbel was also known as Sophie of Saks. She was an American designer and she was the wife of Adam Gimbel, who was the president of Saks Fifth Avenue. She designed custom clothing as well as ready to wear and is also responsible for bringing in the European couture that was sold at Saks during that period. Um, so here is our Dina Merrill wedding gown on the right. And here's an example from the Costume Institute at the Met. And it's fun to kind of c compare, this one is much later, but it's fun to compare some of the technical details, um, like the ruching at the center panel of the bodice here. Um, this one had a sash included with it, but this one here, Dina's did not. Um, and then you see Miss Gimbel in the center of all of her models. She also topped off her wedding ensemble with an ermine, ermine fur <laughs> by Revillian Frere, who was one of the oldest French furriers. Um, ermine is kind of an undercurrent in Dina's <laughs> engagement with 20th century fashion, as we saw it in um, her baby bonnet, and then we saw it on the cover of her first Vogue um, when she wore the Hattie Carnegie hat. And we see it again draped luxuriously around her shoulders for her wedding day. Um, ermine, of course, is very rare and valuable, and it has royal connotations um, dating back to the medieval ages. Revillian Frere had shops in Paris, London, <coughs> Montreal, and New York, and they maintained global trading posts of their own. Uh, Dina here, her face is framed by some fresh tuberoses and she's wearing um, a custom veil that she and her mother arranged to have made for the state. And the veil on each side has Post and Hutton family crests embroidered into the lace work. So it's really something and that's also on display. The fur is on display and um, also on display is this precious Cartier handbag given to her by um, E.F. Hutton and this special handbag, the platinum frame is en engraved with the phrase for you, darling, to carry on your way to happiness, love always, Pappy. And my favorite thing is in this photo, she did indeed carry it with her on that day. And there's Marway in the back as her attendant.
After such a glamorous, well-publicized wedding, Dina still was in the spotlight um, via a reader poll um, that was um, kind of held by a society column, The Smart Set, by Charlie Knickerbocker in New York, New York's Post. Uh, this this was drawn out for weeks, but Dina was named uh, the most photogenic Miss Society, and she beat out. Let's see, she beat out Babe Paley. She beat out um, her cousin Barbara Hutton, and she beat out Gloria Vanderbilt for this title. So she really was the reigning beauty of this time period, and. Here's just a wonderful candid shot from the sea cloud. In an interesting coincidence, when Dina was modeling for Vogue in the 1940s, who do you think was on the masthead as a fashion editor there at the same time? None other than Babe Paley herself. By the mid-1950s, Dina was a mother of three with a burgeoning acting career. Here's one of her headshots from that period. She did appear again on the December 1956 cover of Vogue, again shot by her friend John Rawlings. This is not one of her children, we've <laughs> confirmed. This is just a baby model <laughs> meant to kind of inspire for uh, the winter season. The preceding month at Vogue, um, November, for November, she is filmed, um, you know, conducting her Christmas shopping in New York City. This is complete with a map of all of the places she's got to go. And um, she was actually photographed for this feature by um, the first woman photographer to sign a contract with Vogue, which I think is really cool. Her name was Frances McLaughlin, and um, her images kind of conveyed an all-American optimism, and she was very popular in the 40s and 50s, and I think that, you know, there definitely is some optimism that she's going to cram everything into this car here, but <laughs> get that far across town so quickly. So there was a spate of other Dina Merrill, Merrill appearances in other publications, including Glamour at the far left, Cosmopolitan in the center, and she was illustrated by renowned fra uh, fashion sketch artist Rene Boucher for the 1960 issue of Vogue. Um, her very classical Americana air elegance seemed to pair well with, you know, hot cars. It's, she's kind of being um, posed alongside those things. She was also very popular, um, if you kind of look through, very popular for December issues. Not for this example, but uh, previous examples. She's frequently on the cover in December, perhaps because of her cool tone and coloring. Another um, issue of Town and Country from 1958. She's in Balenciaga um, for the whole spread. Um, here's a shot from the spread. And here is a comparable um, hat that's in the collection at the Met, similar to her little skull cap here. It should, this should be worn a little further back on the head. Um, you know, Balenciaga being a Spanish designer who moved to Paris in 1937 and became very popular um, beginning in the 40s and into the 50s. His work was characterized by these very chic, um, streamlined suits and jackets, almost inspired very roughly by uh, matador suits. And then um, these kind of performative, simple vel velvet hats. Dina made her film debut in 1957 in none other than a Spencer Hepburn, or a Tracy Hepburn um, film, which is excellent. It was Desk Set in 1957, costumes designed by Charles Lemaire. 
Um, in this movie, the storyline is very modern. Um, Dina and Hepburn are both playing archivists in a library of um, a broadcasting, a fictional broadcasting company similar probably to NBC, and they're about to be replaced by computers, even in the 1950s. Um, and Spencer Tracy swoops in. Hepburn is the protagonist, and the costumes were designed by Charles Lemaire, who is over here in this corner. Um, Lemaire began designing for Ziegfeld Follies before he became the executive designer at 20th Century Fox, and he has won three Academy Awards um, for costume design, including All About Eve in 1951. For this movie, he went with very trim, um, simple career girl separates, especially for Dina. She's in a circle skirt, um, a little sweater. Um, over here, she's in a simple suit. And um, the protagonist, Katherine Hepburn, gets to wear kind of the more eccentric, kind of zany costumes for the period. And in one of her memories, Dina um, thinks back to filming this and remembers Katherine Hepburn bringing her wardrobe of gowns by um, Russian-American designer Valentina, who is a really wonderful um, creator of fashion. And I just latched onto that. And she shared them with the other women who are in the film. Next film that she was in with a lasting remark on costume, lasting uh, kind of remark on costumes is Butterfield 8, opposite Liz Taylor. For this movie, costume designer Helen Roll, Rose outfitted outfitted everyone in upper class, I mean upper east side um, chic with tailored suits, um, fine wools, fur, and plenty of pearls as you'll see in these images here. Um, Helen Rose was a close friend of Elizabeth Taylor and they collaborated many times. Helen Rose even went on to design Elizabeth Taylor's wedding gown. She also designed, I know, <laughs> I think the first one. <laughs> she also designed the wedding gown of Grace Kelly. Um, and to her own um, merit, uh, Helen Rose won two Academy Awards for costume design in the 1950s. One for The Bad and the Beautiful, and another for a film called I'll Cry Tomorrow. She also designed, Helen Rose also designed the costumes for the 1963 film, um, The Courtship of Eddie's Father. In this film, Dina is just dripping in furs. I mean, she's in furs in almost a lot of the scenes, and then, or she's in some lovely draped silk chiffon, either one, and she's a brunette, which is scandalous. Um, the other fun thing about this movie is that it does feature a baby Ron Howard as said Eddie in the film. So I recommend it. He's very cute. I tried to sneak him into this presentation, but not such good views of the dresses. So, so um, this is a very famous um, Life magazine shoot, especially around here at Hillwood, you might recognize this particular picture from the dressing room. Um, Dina was photographed for Life by Milton H. Green, who was an American photographer known for his work with Marilyn Monroe, and was called um, Color Photography's Wonder Boy. Um, this sh particular shoot was inspired by art and culture, with Dina appearing on the cover in a hood by Cuban-American designer uh, Luis Estevez. And that was supposed to be inspired by one of Goya's paintings. And then here, of course, the Madame X Sargent reference that, again, you'll see it up in the dressing room. This dress was also designed by Luis Estevez. Finally, in the center, we have her in um, a red Goya suit, a red um, Scazi suit inspired by Goya's portrait of um, Manuel Aricio Manrique de Zunga. And then very, oops, sorry, um, very far 
Right here, she is wearing an ensemble designed by Jax that was inspired by um, Jack Held Jr.'s 1920s illustrations, kind of having that flapper sportswear look. And Jax, of course, was a um, early outpost for designer, Austrian designer Rudi Gernreich. That's where he kind of got his start. You might remember Rudi Gernreich as being the designer who scandalized the world in the 1960s with his monokini, which was basically a topless swimsuit. So here's Dina um, in different Arnold Scazzi ensembles. The center photo is Dina for that very Milton Green photo shoot for life in 1960. The reference for that photo was George Petty's Pinup Girls. Um, so Arnold Scazzi was a friend of Dina's, as you can see here in the photo on the right. Dina's wearing Scazzi again on the far left in her fur-trimmed poppy gown. There's an extant example in a private collection with the same really colorful print. Scazzi um, began working with Pecan and Charles James before he spun off and began his old label in 1956. He was known for his use of luxurious fabrics and was, wasn't afraid to pair fur with a print, as you can see here. Um, he was the choice of evening wear designs for many high-profile entertainers and society women. He's also credited with shortening hemlines for formal wear. So who wore it best in 1962? So here's Dina in the center on Oscar night. This was on April 6th. She's presenting, she actually presented an award that night. Then over here, we have a color photo just for reference of Jackie um, about five days later at the state dinner for the Shah of Iran. Well, I'm not sure if she borrowed it, but um, <laughs> there is an extant example here um, from the study collection at FIT. And I'm grateful to my colleague there, Michelle McVicker, for pointing it out to me as I was doing this research. Um, this gown was purchased, or it bears the label of um, Chez Ninon, which is a New York City-based salon known for the accredited line-for-line -line replicas of Parisian designers. They used the same materials and designs and were, you know, they had permission to do so. Um, Chez Ninon also made the pink Chanel suit worn by Jackie on the day of the assassination. Moving into the 1970s, here are some really fun portraits of Dina and her daughter Nina Rumbau in Town and Country. Um, this is for the same photo shoot and they're probably playing around with designers like Yves Saint Laurent or even for this really colorful one, Stephen Burroughs. Um, this one is on display in the dressing room currently if you want to take a peek. So in the 1970s, she was still active as an actress, but during that time, she also developed her own skincare line, which I'll discuss in a moment. Also in the 1970s, embracing the leisure uh, sportswear trend, full on, jogging in Central Park with none other than Andy Warhol, Grace Jones, Bill Boggs, Mason Reese, and her friend, life photographer Gordon Parks. I still haven't quite unearthed the context of that picture, so any hot tips on that, I'd be so grateful. Um, here's Dina, shot by Richard Avedon for 1972 Vogue, really just embracing um, the audience of Vogue. And she's wearing um, a gown by Stavropoulos, a Greek immigrant who elegantly draped chiffon, silk chiffon on um, women for evening wear. He was championed by Lady Bird Johnson. She's also wearing a brooch by Marguerite Sticks. 
So here is the aforementioned cosmetics and skincare line, Amaranth, which was released in 1970. Here are some really fun advertisements and a shot of what you could use to get such glowing, beautiful skin like Dina. Here she is demonstrating it at a launch in Philadelphia, or Baltimore, Baltimore sorry. And she's wearing an incredibly patterned dress for this, which I think is lovely because it really stands out. Um, so it's 1970 and she's born in 1925, 23. Mm, she told everyone 25. Um, yeah, 40s. Yeah, I can't do math. <laughs> yeah. Too much pressure. She remains an elegant presence in film and society for the next 30 or 40 years. She's known for her creative fashion sense. Um, she plays around, but doesn't do go too crazy. She always looks appropriate. Um, here she is photographed by Yusuf Karsh, again, um, over here for Town and Country in the 70s. Here she is in the center. Um, Photographed by Keith Scott Morton. I can't get the publication name for this. I've struggled with that. But you can see she has a copy of our plates that are on display in uh, the dining room. Um, here she is for her favorite phil philan philanthropic cause, um, New York Mission Society. Um, this was in a brochure for a gala held in her honor in 1995. And I really... Um, gravitated towards this spotted pattern and juxtaposed with the children's yellow shirts. She's wearing again over here on the far left um, a chiffon gown by Stavropoulos, the Greek designer I mentioned earlier. So Dina through the years, there's so many great photos to choose from and I really struggled settling on my final picks. So I had to leave you um, towards the end of this presentation here with some highlights over her um, career. Um, she insisted in a Vogue interview that she doesn't, she likes clothes that she wears that don't wear her and she doesn't like big production numbers. On the contrary, I think it's quite clear that she can carry both. Um, whether it's be beach pajamas on the sea cloud or an Arnold Scazzi fur-trimmed jacket, she is very adept at balancing the high and low. Very much like this museum, Dina seamlessly blended the chic and elegance with warmth and approachability in her style. Here she is in a 1984 town and country shoot. She's wearing a beautiful Skazi rainbow colored gown in Hillwood's very own Japanese garden. Here at Hillwood, we're very grateful for her support and generous donations of art objects, jewelry and apparel, which you can see upstairs, to its collection, as well as her participation as a member of Hillwood Museum and Gardens Foundation's Board of Trustees. I've really enjoyed this focus on 20th century fashion through such a ma multifaceted figure. I'm really grateful for everyone from, for listening, and I hope you enjoyed um, the intersection of American fashion through Dina Merrill, or the fashionable life of Dina Merrill. So I think I'm, questions, anyone? Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the uh, clothes are uh, on view in the mansion. How long will they be there? Um, they will be on view until January. Yes, so you have some time to take a peek. Sorry, the question was, how long will the clothes be on view in the mansion? And they will be on view until January for those in simulcast. Hello. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, so 
she had three children, right? Three or four children, four children, three husbands. Um, she was first married in 1946, and then she had um, a smaller wedding here at Hillwood in the 60s, Cliff Robertson, and then finally she married Ted Hartley in the 1980s. And yes, she was in so many films and TV shows, and she enjoyed um, uh, 80s, 1980s revival on Broadway in many, many plays. Any other questions? So are her children all living, would you know? Um, I think two have, the question was, are her children all living and two have passed away? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. So are a lot of her belongings that Hill would have liked to have elsewhere? Or does Hill would pretty much have uh, most everything? So the question was, are a lot of her belongings elsewhere, um, and does Hill would have most everything? We primarily have pieces that were um, acquired for her by Marjorie or related to Marjorie. Her other belongings are probably elsewhere. Yes, of course. All right. Any 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 last questions? Um, Thank you again, everyone. Thanks for braving the rain. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This? Thank you. I bet you had fun doing it. Oh, it was well, not fun. No, I had so much fun.